Hello. Uh, yeah. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Chandrasekhar lecture uh, by Professor Don Frankel. Uh, I'm delighted to see the house full, uh, uh, and uh, I hope uh, there will be space for even the people who are uh, trickling in uh, uh, to sit. Uh, I, I, before Don gives his uh, lecture, I'll just uh, take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about ICTS, the institution uh, you're in. Uh, perhaps many of you have been here for some uh, of our activities before, but for those who haven't and are here for the first time, uh, I'll just give you a bird's eye view of, uh, uh, of ICTS. Um, uh, so the ICTS campus was sort of uh, conceived around 2012 by, uh, uh, by, and this is the architect plan as it was at that time, but within um, a span of few years, uh, in, in a time scale actually quite fast for, by Indian standards, the whole campus uh, uh, came up. We actually moved in here by 2015, and by 2017, the last uh, bits of the campus construction were uh, were complete, and uh, and you uh, if you have had a chance to go around, you would have seen that we are now operational. All uh, the, we have a computing center. There's a library which is now filling up uh, with books. Uh, uh, the guest house, if you are staying there, uh, and uh, and um, uh, so on. Uh, but uh, I really wanted to tell you uh, more about not so much about the campus, but about. Uh, what as an institution we do. So we have a three-pronged mandate, which is uh, which consists of uh, uh, a tightly interwoven strands of programs, research, and outreach. Uh, uh, so programs are programs like the one in which this lecture is embedded in, uh, and uh, they bring together scientists uh, from all around the world, and that's why we call ourselves an international center. Uh, but they also have a pedagogical component, and in that sense uh, uh, are also aimed at the younger researchers in the country and elsewhere. Uh, we have our own research. Uh, faculty in a variety of areas, and I'll sh uh, show you uh, the list uh, soon. Um, and uh, many of them take active role in uh, organizing the programs. Uh, so these two are uh, connected to each other. Uh, uh, the, uh, our research, as well as through our programs, we also believe in uh, doing a lot of uh, vigorous outreach, and uh, and that's uh, and I'll say a little bit about that uh, too. Uh, and many ways we are modeled after institutions elsewhere in the world which have been successful in uh, doing this, uh, like the KITP in Santa Barbara, the Newton Institute in Cambridge, ICTP, IAS Princeton, but. I think with significant innovations and differences which make it certainly a unique institution in India and perhaps internationally. And that definitely holds out a lot of possibilities, a sort of a new canvas for Indian science. Uh, so that's what uh, excites all the people who are here. Uh, our researchers are a very youthful set of people working in uh, various areas in theoretical physics, mathematics, quantitative biology, and going ahead, uh, we hope, in other theoretical areas like theoretical computer science, etc. But at the moment, we have active groups in astrophysical relativity. Uh, our group here was very much involved with the original uh, analysis and discovery of gravitational waves. I should say discovery and analysis of gravitational waves. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, string theory group probes uh, features of the uh, very same black holes, but at the more uh, quantum or fundamental level. Statistical mechanics, condensed matter physics, uh, the themes of this meeting, and similarly so biophysics and soft matter. Uh, um, uh, Fluid dynamics, we have people working on fundamental aspects of turbulence, but also uh, trying to apply insights from there to uh, complex systems like the monsoon. And, uh, and finally, mathematics uh, in, a, uh, in a way which interfaces also with other areas in physics, in, uh, in computer science, and so on. We have active groups in probability, in uh, geometry and physics, and partial differential equations, etc. Um, 
So this is just an advertisement for uh, uh, the work that we did, uh, our group did in gravitational waves, which got uh, highlighted internationally. Um, uh, the uh, uh, ICTS programs, the second prong of our mandate, uh, again, we are very active. We have had maybe about 25 or so discussion meetings and, and uh, programs in the last year. Uh, so every year, typically, that's the rate. At, uh, so we set us a rather blistering pace, I think, for uh, events uh, uh, that we have here. And if you look at our website, we have a full calendar uh, um, for 2018. 2019 is almost all. Uh, booked out, uh, and right now we have a call open for proposals from April 2020 to September 2020. So uh, that's uh, so you have to think uh, far enough ahead if you want to organize a program here. And we welcome proposals from not only India, from academics all over the world. Uh, uh, and as you can see, this is uh, uh, it's a hot summer in much of the on much of the planet, but it's the weather is pleasant in Bangalore, and so. Uh, so that you have incentives to organize programs here throughout the year. Uh, um, uh, so anyhow, uh, our programs are uh, platforms for new initiatives and directions in the country. We, of course, want researchers to come together and uh, come up with new ideas and new directions, etc. cetera. We, we, we do lay some emphasis on programs which would uh, uh, which would try to develop capacity in India uh, in areas where we are not so well represented, and I've just listed a few over here. And more generally, we would like, in our a small way, to um, to to connect uh, to connect a, a variety. I mean, connect people in the whole scientific ecosystem, going from basic sciences, experimental and theoretical, to uh, more engineering and applied sciences, to industry, and maybe even in this program, there might be some elements of that brought in, if I'm not mistaken. In terms of numbers, yeah, since the beginning, we've had about 127 programs and, and 50 odd discussion meetings. But as I said, in recent years, it's been on the average about 25 or so per year, uh, with um, more than 12,000 participants, good fraction from abroad. All the talks of our meeting are archived or, uh, with, uh, with the permission of the speaker. Uh, uh, we put up all our lectures on YouTube. Uh, on our dedicated ICTS uh, channel, uh, uh, YouTube channel. Um, we've had several of these Chandrasekhar, Ramanujan, and Turing lecture series, and also other named lecture series like the Abdus Salam lecture series and ICTS distinguished lectures. As I said, the calendar is full, but um, here's a list of sort of a somewhat uh, representative uh, list of the kind of Topics we've covered in mathematics, in cosmology, in condensed matter physics, and nanoscale, and biology, uh, and back to uh, cosmology, but also uh, things even in, uh, we've had forays in computer science and uh, even in finance. Uh, uh, finally, the outreach component of ICTS, again, as I said, very vigorous. We have a large number of public lectures, and uh, the lectures on YouTube have been very popular. Uh, not the public lectures, everything put together has had large number of views with a growing number of subscribers. I think this is out of date now. There are probably 15,000 subscribers. Uh, uh, so, and other initiatives have been uh, special initiatives uh, such as the 100 years of general relativity and the mathematics of planet Earth. Uh, which were, of course, uh, one-time one events. But uh, starting off on that, we had this series which continues called the Einstein Lectures, where we partner with institutions around the country. Uh, the Mathematics of Planet Earth uh, was, again, something which we were partner with uh, several institutions in the city uh, and uh, had exhibits uh, at the Science Museum. Uh, so, um, and right now we are planning for 2019, uh, ICTS is spearheading a sort of a unique initiative to have a science festival in Bangalore. And maybe those of you who are in Bangalore will hear more about it. And those of you who are not uh, should come back for these events. Uh, maybe it'll uh, probably culminate in October 2019 with sort of a 
three-day event across the city in multiple venues, multiple themes, etc. So stay tuned for that. Uh, pictures. Uh, our sort of flagship outreach event uh, has been this copy with curiosity, which has been very successful. It's a monthly series at the planetarium. So because of its central location, a lot of people have been coming uh, for our events and uh, it's a sort of unique in its format. Also, there's a lot of time for question and answer and discussion. It's live streamed on YouTube, and people ask questions online as well. And uh, so it's uh, and this is again an instance how uh, we do interweave our programs with uh, with these activities, and that often the speakers are. Uh, people who have come for one of our programs. Um, it aims to stimulate, of course, the curiosity of the public, but a large part of the audience are school and college students, and uh, it's been running for nearly two years now, and it's, uh, it's been very, uh, very heartening. Last month we had, well, a week ago we had a wonderful lecture by Arvind Gupta on uh, science, essentially on the theme of doing science with everyday stuff, and uh, it was uh, it was had a unique energy when it comes up on YouTube. If you haven't, if you weren't there at the lecture, I would encourage you to watch it. Uh, uh, next, I think next Sunday, uh, next Sunday ninth, uh, two Sundays from now. Sorry, uh, we have a lecture by Tanvi Jain, a mathematician, uh, on a finite discussion of the infinite. So, uh, uh, so if you are around, you can come for it. Uh, these were some other special events we had in connection with our 10th anniversary, uh, which we celebrated in January this year. And uh, apart from a scientific meeting, which had uh, speakers from a variety of subjects, uh, 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 both represented at ICTS and, and things where, uh, which uh, we would like to grow in. Uh, but not only that, we had public events like a public lecture by Robert Digraph and a panel discussion afterwards with some very eminent scientists and other public figures. And, and then, of course, this public lecture by Kip Thorne, which was a, uh, which was a runaway success. It, had, uh, it was held in the foyer outside. And uh, once again, uh, it, it, the number of people who showed up uh, was in the 1,500 or so, and a lot of people from all over, many people from outside Bangalore came especially for this event. Uh, so that was uh, something, and um, uh, anyway, I won't keep you further from Dan's talk. Uh, so before we start that, I'll, I'd like to introduce Srikant. Uh, I'd like to ask Srikant, who will introduce Dan. Uh, Srikant is one of the organizers uh, of this meeting. Um, so uh, over to you, Srikant. Okay, good evening. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce today's speaker, Professor Dan Frenkel, uh, from the University of Cambridge. Um, <clears throat> so, Prof Professor Fren Frenkel is a, a world-renowned uh, researcher in the study of soft matter and perhaps the leading authority on computational investigations uh, in this uh, vast and expanding domain of research. Um, so Dan did his PhD at the University of Amsterdam and was a postdoc at UCLA with another favorite Dan of mine, Dan Kivelson. Um, and, and, and then he's uh, spent a couple of decades at AMOL for the University of uh, Amsterdam before moving to Cambridge uh, in 2007, uh, where he has been uh, since. Um, over the course of his career, uh, uh, he has investigated the statistical mechanics of key phenomena uh, in soft matter systems, such as their kinetics, self-assembly, and phase behavior. Uh, the systems investigated uh, uh, range from idealized systems, such as hot sphere fluids and crystals, to colloidal systems of different degrees of complexity, uh, to self-assembling self complex macromolecular and biological systems, um, I, I won't be able to tell you about all the different things that uh, he's done, but just as one example of his contributions, I'd like to mention nucleation phenomena. So if you were to get interested in looking at nucleation of any kind and, and, and uh, uh, try to sort of educate yourself about what has been done, it's very hard to find any interesting aspect of the problem 
where he has not made central contributions. Um, so, um, as uh, I mentioned, uh, as a leading uh, a practitioner of computation, uh, Dan is uh, well known for developing a wide range of uh, methods to investigate soft matter systems. And uh, one of the sort of characteristic, characteristic features of, of, of his work is, is the clear and rigorous statistical mechanics within which these methods uh, have been formulated. And equally, uh, Dan's work is characterized by the depth of theoretical insight uh, gained from these simulations and have driven uh, further theoretical investigations in many, many cases. Um, as most of you who have tried to do any kind of soft matter uh, simulations know, uh, Dan is the author of the Bible in the field, uh, along with Baron Smith, called Understanding Molecular Simulation. Uh, the title of the book itself uh, is, is very characteristic of the style uh, with which Dan uh, sort of both uh, practices uh, <coughs> soft matter computation and, and, and the style that uh, he's a, a very well-known advocate of. Um, so Dan's uh, distinguished uh, record of contributions has been recognized in various ways. And I'll not be able to recite the entire list, but I just want to mention a few uh, awards and recognitions he's a recipient of. Uh, he's uh, uh, the recipient of the Bernie Alder CCAM Prize of the European Physical Society, the Anisur Rahman Prize for Computational Physics of the American Physical Society. Um, he's been elected a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences elected foreign member of the Royal Society, foreign associate of the National uh, Academy of Sciences USA, and, and uh, he's the 2016 uh, recipient of the Boltzmann Medal, the most important recognition uh, for contributions to statistical mechanics. Um, <clears throat> so the list could go on, but, it, but I won't. Um, so uh, to, to sort of come to uh, today's uh, um, lecture. Um, let me begin by saying that Dan's work has a long history of, of thinking about entropy, a central theme, of course, uh, for all of statistical mechanics and certainly uh, for most uh, interesting soft matter phenomena or many interesting soft matter phenomena, uh, from entropy-driven interactions to ordering to more recent work investigating Edwards entropy in granular systems to entropic and information aspects of a DNA mediated addressable multi component assembly. Uh, entropic considerations have been a running theme in Dan's thinking about soft matter. Uh, fittingly, therefore, uh, entropy will figure uh, in the title of, of uh, today's lecture and in much of, of what he will uh, talk about uh, in the next three days. Uh, so Dan will uh, deliver a series of three named lecture, the lectures, the Infosys uh, ICTS Chandrasekhar lectures on consecutive days starting today, uh, each at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, the next two lectures will form part of the uh, program of the workshop on uh, entropic effects in self-driven and directed assembly that starts tomorrow morning and runs till the 31st. So today, Dan will deliver the first lecture uh, on order, disorder, and entropy. Um, before he starts, let me mention that Dan has been a regular visitor to India and a great friend of the soft matter community here, which adds to the pleasure of inviting him to deliver the Infosys ICTS lectures. And before we do so, uh, I, I believe Rajesh has another pleasant duty to perform. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Chandan Das Gupta uh, to come and present a small memento to uh, uh, to Dan Frankel before uh, before he begins his lecture on behalf of ICTS. Yeah. It's a small made of sandwich. <laughs> yes, before I start, uh, I should 
first of all like to thank the ICTS uh, for inviting me to give this, this set of lectures. I feel really honored to be here, have been invited to do so. Uh, it's the Sandra Sekar lectures. I'm speaking in the Ramanujan audience. Uh, it has a distinct Trinity feel to me. And uh, uh, as you may know, I, I'm associated with Trinity College myself, but uh, I'm at a rather different level from these other two real luminaries. Um, I, I, I also should say that I very much enjoy the environment here at the ICTS and I was very much impressed when Rajiv said that the plans were drawn up in 2012 and the whole place is, is up and running now already for a few years and um, in 2012 when I was head of department of chemistry in Cambridge um, we were discussing for the nth time, plans to build a new chemistry department, and we concluded that, uh, or we were told that this would be done in 10 years' time. I'm no longer head of the department, but still I've been told that it will be done in 10 years' time. So <laughs> you should be a bit less critical of the speed of things in India, I would say. Um, the, um, the next thing I have to do before I start is to apologize to my colleagues uh, many of whom will have heard what I'm going to say today and actually in the coming two days. And this is intentional uh, because what I'm going to do in these three lectures is not to give a research talk. So on the whole, although I may include some recent results, uh, it's not a talk that focuses on recent results. Rather, what I will try to do is to, to st set the stage for this workshop and, 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 and so the, the meeting and the workshop in the, in the coming days and weeks uh, to uh, give a general background, to set some questions, to so make some statements, some of which are hopefully wrong, so that there's something to discuss. And, and, uh, and in, in th for that reason, I, I, will, I will be uh, giving a, a talk in, in, along very general lines. It will be very uh, thin on mathematics, uh, there'll be essentially no equations and I'll try to focus on concepts and, and hope that uh, there'll be time for discussion at the end. That's also why I have this timer here to, to keep me honest. The, the, the one thing that I, I would like to comment on though uh, was also in the, in the introduction, Maria G's, about uh, the fact that ICTS allows people to, to dive deep and gain deeper understanding of new concepts. And I found that actually with the subject of the workshop, which is entropy, my understanding as a function of time has basically been going like this. So this is time, this is understanding, US, understanding of entropy. And I think it went more or less like this, up, 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 as I, and I think I'm somewhere here now. And this is, this is what I would like to convey. Uh, I find it much, much harder and harder to understand as I think more and more about it. And so I hope that uh, if I can achieve anything, uh, I can help you think, uh, at least stimulate to think about the problem yourself, because you think that all these things have been sorted out, but as far as I can tell, uh, that's simply not true. Um, now see if this works. Yes, so... <laughs> Let me now start with the, uh, the lecture of today, which is order, disorder, and entropy. And all these people will uh, return in some way or another during my talk. Uh, but the, the reason is why I bring up the subject is because over the past decades, uh, our understanding of the relation between entropy and order has changed, although I'm not quite sure yet in which direction it will move. It, it is certainly not the same as it used to be before. And this is what I'll try to explain today. And so I'll say a bit about the, the, the prehistory of entropy. I'll say something about uh, computers, the role of computer simulations in understanding entropy. And I'll say something about entropy and sand, which is strictly what I really mean is entropy and granular media. Um, so. You cannot talk about entropy without going back to the origins of entropy, and that, that is thermodynamics. And so I have here a, a picture of one of my heroes, Sadi Carnot, who in the 1820s wrote uh, the article that effectively uh, defined the whole field of thermodynamics. He, he, he was asking himself the question, what is the maximum amount of power that you can extract from a given amount of heat? And in doing so, uh, he, he basically asked all the right questions. He introduced the, the idea of a reversible engine. He re introduced the idea 
uh, of, the, of course, of the Carnot cycle as we now know it, he didn't actually formulate thermodynamics. And the reason why he didn't is that at the time, people believed that heat was a conserved quantity, caloric. And Carnot, actually, if you read what he wrote, he didn't believe it, but he accepted that this was the, the current point of view. So many experiments seem to have supported, so he assumed that that was correct. Uh, or he, he, in his writing, he did that. And if, I'm pretty sure that if he had realized that heat is not a conserved quantity, he would have more or less developed all of thermodynamics. But in the end, uh, it, it was left to other people to complete his work, uh, mainly Clausius, who was the f person who really rediscovered Carnot in the 1850s and, and took the next step. So uh, to, to formulate thermodynamics, uh, the best way is to actually do it in terms of a song uh, about the laws of thermodynamics. This song was actually written in the in the early late 50s, early 60s by a, a British uh, duo, uh, Flanders and Swan, who had a song about the second law of thermodynamics. And uh, I will not talk about the first law, uh, but mainly about the second law. And the second law, they formulate as follows. Uh, they say, heat won't pass from a cooler to a hotter, you can try if you like, but you're far better than not. So basically, it says heat doesn't spontaneously flow from from cold, cold from a low temperature to a high temperature, and uh, that is indeed the the experimental version of the second law of thermodynamics, which therefore is actually a very very simple law. I mean, there's it, there's there's a bit of a tautology built in in the sense that what is hotter and what is colder, cooler. Well, I mean, of course. We all know that <laughs> by if you bring two contacts in contact, that the heat flows from hot to cold. So this is not the way to do it. I mean, that's then you have a circular reasoning. The only thing is that if you order objects according to which way heat flows, and you take any object from the set and bring them in contact, you know which way the heat is going to flow. So that is the way you should read the second law of thermodynamics in this version. Now, uh, the, the the point about thermodynamics, and now I actually read list the first law and the second law, is that uh, the first law, I think, is, is for many physicists less interesting than the second law. I mean, uh, I think it is, although in the 1930s there were people almost ready to give up on the first law, on energy conservation at least, I think that people now believe that energy is conserved and that therefore if you look at heat and work together, that that's a conserved quantity. The second law, heat doesn't follow spontaneously from, from, from cold to hot, uh, is, is the core of thermodynamics. And, but if you formulate thermodynamics just like that, it is very difficult to make progress. And so what happened in the, in the 1850s is that Rudolf Clausius appeared, and Rudolf Clausius, as I said, had been reading the work of Carnot, and he reformulated this very simple statement that nobody uh, could object to, or that nobody would find particularly difficult to something that has been the horror of many undergraduate students. Uh, namely, he introduced, actually in a very small number of steps that really, I mean, it's easy to reproduce, but I won't do it now, is uh, that from this statement, heat doesn't flow spontaneously from cold to hot, he said there must be a quantity that he called entropy, and if you have a closed system, so a system that cannot exchange energy of particles with the environment, then in that system, the end, this, this quantity S, which is the entropy, uh, will never spontaneously decrease. And uh, what the, the, the and so this was the basis for all the thermodynamics that follows, in particular what happens subsequently when Gibbs looked at phase coexistence, etc. It is all based on. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which way things would go spontaneously and how you can read it to entropy and particularly the entropy is a state function, is a function of the, of the parameters that characterize the system. Now, there's one thing that Clausius did not tell us and that is what is entropy. And, and you think maybe he forgot or something like that. No, no, he didn't. Um, he had his ideas about what entropy was but he didn't want to write it down. And the reason why he did not want to write it down is because, for good reasons, he was very pr proud of his, his second law of thermodynamics. Um, the, uh, and he thought, if I now 
couple my second law with a statement of what entropy is, and people later out find out find out that entropy is something different, they will improve the definition of entropy, and then they will claim the second law. So he's not going to do that. So that's why actually he left it to other people to actually fill in the, the explanation of the, the what entropy meant. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but uh, uh, the, I mean, the, the importance of the statement uh, cannot be overestimated. Uh, now, the person who actually started giving a microscopic interpretation to the, the, what entropy is, is another famous 19th century or early 20th century scientist. It's Ludwig Boltzmann. You see here his gravestone. And on the grave, you have the, the first uh, microscopic expression for entropy. Uh, it relates the entropy as, I mean, actually different symbols were used for entropy, but here they use this symbol that now is commonly used as is k log w, where w is the number of states in which a system can, can be found. So you have a closed system, can be found in many different states. And k is just a proportionality constant. And so Boltzmann has the, the, the fortune, the good or bad fortune, to be named after proportionality constant that actually only is there due to a fluke in the sense that entropy had already de de been defined with a dimension before Boltzmann came along. So this is just to match this entropy to the existing entropy. The main thing is, Boltzmann said, uh, according to his gravestone at least, that the, uh, the entropy is related to the law of the number of states in which you can find a system. Now there's something strange about that, because the idea that a system has many states is really quantum mechanical. So in quantum mechanics, we know that if you have an isolated system, it can be in different energy eigenstates, and that number of eigenstates may be incredibly large, but it's in principle countable. And so then this statement makes sense. If you use only classical mechanics, then the idea of counting states is strictly speaking not correct. So actually Boltzmann had a way of, of talking about entropy by dividing up phase space in, in or actually he, what is not quite phase space, in, in small volume elements and then get something that is very, very similar. But this is not what you see on the graves. On here it is really about the number of states. So you can say, so how did Boltzmann know uh, that you could write S K log W before he actually knew about quantum mechanics? And so you should realize that the, the quantum mechanics started in a very, at a very simple level in the, uh, at 1900, but certainly it was not uh, at that stage a theory that was used to dis describe many body systems. So this is a bit of a mystery. And the, re the reason why uh, this, this, this statement is on Boltzmann's grave is because he actually didn't write it. The person who wrote S is K log W for the first time was not Boltzmann. It is not a totally unknown physicist, I must have a quote here. It's somebody called Max Planck who wrote, as you may well remember, an article, actually this one appeared in 1901, but the work was done in 1900, on black body radiation, where he first introduced the concept of a quantum. So the H Planck's constant was dates back to that, that date. And here you see the original German text where he talks about uh, entropy. And he actually says here S is K log W plus a constant. The constant will come back to later, but S is K log W. Now Bols Planck acknowledges Boltzmann. He says this is inspired by the work of Boltzmann. So certainly the ideas of Boltzmann are in here, but Planck was the first one to write it down. And so uh, now how did it end up on Boltzmann's grave? This is of course a question you were all burning to know. Uh, what happened is that Boltzmann, as you may know, committed suicide in 1906, was buried in Vienna, but there was not yet a monument on his grave. And then by the late 1920s, early 1930s, they, people thought, and this particular Planck and Einstein were great fans of Boltzmann, they said there should be something more substantial, that they got a stone, they got a statue, they only needed a text. And then they thought, what well, text? And then Planck said, how about SSK log W? And that's how it ended up on the grave. The unfortunate consequence is that when Max Planck then died, <laughs> So I thought that we should correct this error, and my proposition is this. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Right. good. Um, so this is S is K log W, and as I said, I mean, talk to the curve. Do, 
I mean, the more I think about it, the more actually I, I'm impressed by what it means, because it is, it is much less obvious than you might think. I mean, I've been teaching it, and I say, it is so simple, you just count states, and there you are. And, and the more I think about it, the less simple it is. But okay, uh, the main thing is that even though we think it's simple, most other people don't. And so uh, if you try to, to explain the concept of entropy to somebody else, you can hardly say, oh, you know, just S is K log W. They, 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 it, it, it just doesn't uh, cut wood with a, a non-science audience. And so what you find is that when people talk about entropy uh, in, a, in a, I mean, outside physics or, or for physical chemistry, they have a diff very different point of view about entropy. And uh, to find that, you just have to look up Wikipedia, and you see this. Entropy is commonly understood as a measure of disorder. And so this is the way people think about entropy. I mean, if if you look at my desk, it gets disorder spontaneously. Entropy increases. That makes eminent sense. Uh, and actually, almost always, an increase in entropy is associated with an increase in visible disorder. So it's not at all a bad idea. The only thing is, it is not equivalent to the second law. And to see that, uh, let's look at the, the situation at a particularly well-known example of ordering, and the, 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 the well-known example is this one, uh, freezing. So if you go from a liquid, which is clearly disordered, to a crystal that is clearly ordered, how you, and you do this in a closed system, so you have a crystal where there, if a closed system where there's a liquid, and you have the liquid, say, at a temperature where it should freeze, at some point, if you wait long enough, part of the liquid will freeze, and so how is this possible? And the, the usual explanation is say, yeah, of course, this is order, so this has low entropy, but when it freezes, it releases heat that heats up the rest of the system. So as a whole, or the rest of the universe, people usually say, as a whole, the entropy of the, of the, the world goes up, and that's why it happens. But that only works if you have any heat to release. So this is a, a sketch of what it means. Oh, disorder, order, and then you have this Maxwell Bean demon who actually asks for your, that you pay in energy. I, I understand that Maxwell demons use non-SI units, but okay, then, uh, that's, you see that. Okay, right. Um, so you must, to decrease the, the entropy, you must pay energy. Now that only works if you have energy to pay. And so what happened uh, in, the, in the early 1940s is that people started to, to question this assumption. So is it really true that if you have no energy to pay, that you cannot freeze. And uh, so this is where the computer age comes in, because uh, in, the, in the early 1940s, Monroe and Kirkwood argued that actually even in a system where they, you cannot pay any energy, and that's a system of particles that have an excluded volume, but have no energetic interaction, no attraction, no repulsion. So wherever the particles are, the potential energy is zero, then the total energy is, is only kinetic. And it means that if you change phase, you don't change the kinetic energy, and so uh, there is no change in the energy that is in the crystal or in the liquid. You don't release energy. You can't c increase the entropy by paying heat to the rest of the universe. And so the question is, uh, could these things freeze? Now, Kirkwood and Monroe did this, analyzed the problem with an approximate uh, integral equation that Gave suggested that this might be the case, but it, it was just an approximation, so they didn't really know. And then, of course, the, the idea is, well, let's try and do experiments instead to test it. But how do you do experiments on particles that that don't attract and don't repel, that are just hard particles? I mean, atoms are simply not like that. I mean, you have always dispersion force, etc. So it, it took uh, until the mid-1950s before people actually start to address the problem, and the, they didn't do that initially experimentally, but they did it with what are actually the earliest computer experiments. So the, in the early days of computers, people tried to solve some of the hard outstanding problems at the time, and one of the outstanding problems was actually the nature of the, of the hard sphere freezing transition. And so here you see a picture of uh, some of the people involved. Uh, the, there actually were two teams. One is the, the, the team at Livermore that you see here, the other team was uh, Wood and Jacobson at Los Alamos. They did Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, Older Wainwright did the early computer simulations. And sorry, there's somebody else, Marianne Mensai, uh, who is not on the paper that was subsequently published, but she was not unimportant because Marianne Mensai is the person who actually 
wrote all the programs and ran all the programs. So um, these days, hopefully, she would have been on the paper. Uh, anyway, they, 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 this trio together with Wood and Jacobson published a paper where they looked at what happens with if you increase the density of a system of purely hard spheres, no attraction, no repulsion, except that they can't overlap. And they found that, in fact, these systems uh, do freeze spontaneously if you compress beyond a certain density. And so uh, that means that uh, th this is a liquid that you don't, you don't release energy. And so it really means that the, the entropy at that density, the entropy of the liquid phase is lower than the entropy of the solid phase, which is very counterintuitive because clearly, in this case, this looks ordered, this looks disordered, and yet this has, has now the lower entropy and this the higher entropy. So this is, this is one of the, the examples where really computer simulations s changed our thinking about entropy, at least or confirmed a hypothesis about entropy that computer simulations at that stage conf did confirm. Now, uh, it didn't stay with computer simulations, uh, the, because uh, initially in the, in, the, in the first decades or the first few years after this uh, numerical s study, uh, people were incredibly skeptical. They said, no, I can't possibly be true, there must be something wrong, and anyway, what are these computer simulations? This, and so, uh, I mean, again, I could talk a long time about it, I will not, but the main thing is that it took quite a while, and increasingly simulation upon simulation showed the same thing. There were then theories that predicted the same thing, but I think as for many people, what clenched it is that uh, in the, in the uh, in the 1980s, people were able to make colloidal suspensions of particles, colloidal particles, that effectively behave like hard spheres. So you need particles that are in a solution that is, the particles are uncharged, the solution is non-polar, the particles have to need refractive index mass to the solution, and these particles really behave like hard spheres. And you can test that because with light scattering, you can measure the equation of state and compare the hard sphere predictions, and it works extremely well. And this is a famous picture from an article by Pierre Vermeegen, 1986, where you see a suspension of hard PMMA, so plastic spheres, 200 nanometers, and here you increase the density, and as you see, as you increase the density, this is from about 49% to about 54%, you see these colored specks. These are crystals, and they're colored because what you see are the Bragg reflections, because a colloidal crystal has Bragg reflections in the visible, not in the X-ray. And so that's why you actually directly can see the crystal, and you see the, that you're going through a two-phase region, and here you have 0%, and here you have 100% crystal. And then what happens beyond that is a different story. But the main thing is that you, you, you now have simulations, you have theories to back it up, and most importantly, you have experiments. And so this is something that, that people generally now believe. Um, now, it, it has, this, this whole thing has e evolved a lot more in recent years, when a number of groups have, have been looking at, at the ordering of uh, particles with, with, with different shapes, not just spheres, but here you see examples of uh, well, all kinds of different shapes, uh, but all hard particles. And the important thing about uh, these, these simulations is that uh, depending on the shape of the particles, you can get a wide range of different uh, structures. And they can be crystal structures, so here you see all kind of different simple crystal structures, or many of the Bravais lattices you can see. You can get uh, liquid crystal structures, pneumatic, smectic, columnar, etc. You can even get quasi-crystals, and this is all driven by entropy. Now, um, and here you see a, a kind of something that, that tries to characterize what you get depending on the shape parameters of these quantities. So you see here you get crystals, here you get liquid crystals and everything in between, but that is not the subject. The main thing is simply that you can get this wide range of ordered phases simply by packing, simply by entropy. Um, now, the, oh sorry, the thing I actually should say, and this is really important, is that actually the hard sphere freezing transition was not the first example of an entropic phase transition. The earlier, <coughs> the earliest example was actually uh, the, transi the, the transition between a fluid of rod-like particles that at lower density is orientationally disordered that at higher density uh, is orientationally ordered. And some, this is something that had been discovered experimentally 
on uh, colloidal suspensions in the 1930s, and people thought it had to do with the attraction between the rods. And then Lars Onsager said uh, that actually, no, this is due to entropy, because when the particles order, they, they gain in translational entropy and they lose in orientational entropy, and the balance at high density shifts in the direction that this has the, at the given density, the higher entropy. Now, I want to say one thing that you, I mean, certainly the younger people in the audience may not be familiar with. This thing is called a cigarette. And um, you see it rarely these days, but the thing is that if you smoke too many cigarettes, then what happens is this. Um, okay. Um, there you have the grave of Lawrence Ansager, and you see they left some space free because actually it was a family grave, so his wife later, much later actually, but 15 years later, was buried in the same grave. And this is 15 years later, and you see now his wife is there, but there's something strange about the grave. And the strange thing is this. They, they added an asterisk and they said, etc. So just as Nobel laureate, which is true, but they added an etc. So, I mean, there's not that many graves that have an etc. on it. So you have to, to wonder, why would it be? And to, to understand that, you have to, to think, compare it with another grave, namely the grave of Kirkwood. I just mentioned that Kirkwood was the person who first predicted that hard spheres might freeze. Kirkwood's grave looks like this. Uh, I can only I can only describe it as a CV for afterlife. I don't know where I can, um, um, and so the reason the reason why Onsager had the etc on his grave is because actually these two graves are next to each other. And so, <laughs> okay, good. So that this this gives you some insight in Onsager, who actually. Uh, in my, my third lecture, I'll come back to Onsager, who is just, uh, to me, is an incredible genius in the sense that, really, as I progress in this direction, I understand how little I understand of Onsager, but okay, that's, that will come later. And so, actually, here you see the liquid crystals, and actually, what later with computer simulations could be shown is that you don't have just an emetic, but the smack, and all these things can be formed by the rod-like particles, but Onsager showed, that, showed that how, how this works, purely theoretical. Okay, and everything has been observed experimentally. For us, that's very nice. For instance, we, we predicted that there should be a columnar phase of disk-like particles, and then uh, about 10 years later, the, the group of Henk Lecker, Kekker, and Utrecht showed that indeed these columnar phases do appear. And how they can see this from this, I don't know, but they've told me it's really true, so it must be true. Okay, so this I already showed. Sorry, why is it coming back? I don't know. So this is what I want to say about the, the, the simple entropy. Um, or simple entropy, the entropy that actually has to do with ordering, disordering, and phase transitions. I now want to talk about a different form of entropy, and it's much, it's much on much more shaky foundation. And uh, but still, uh, you should not dismiss the idea that you can apply entropy outside of standard statistical mechanics. I'll try to explain in a few words what I mean. So uh, my own. Confrontation with this granular entropy concept came a long time ago, it was in 1990, the first international conference on liquid matter physics. There was a plenary talk by Sam Edwards, and he talked about powders viewed as liquids, in which he developed a statistical mechanics of powders. Now, powders are particles that are heavy, sufficiently heavy, that they don't, don't undergo Brownian motion. As, so, standard statistical mechanics doesn't apply. You can't use Boltzmann S is K log W. And what Sam Edwards said, is okay, I accept that, but I'll try to, and this is actually in the proceedings of that meeting, I try to define a quantity that is like the Boltzmann entropy, where I now use, instead of, in, in, in thermodynamics, you say, uh, the relation between entropy and temperature is dS, dE is one over, is one over T, or d, dE, dS is T, and he says we'll do something similar, but now the, the variable is not the energy, but the volume, and then you can define a quantity that he calls X, at that time called that the compactness, and he says this quantity is, plays the same role as temperature, but now for granular materials, the only thing is the entropy has to be different, and he said the entropy is a well-defined quantity, it's the logarithm, not of the number of states, but the number of ways in which the grains can be assembled to fill the vol a volume V. Now, that is a, uh, a strange quantity, at least you can def imagine what it must be like, um, because if you, if you think of a, of a container, there, there's clearly many, many different ways in which you, you can uh, 
fill it to to get a particular uh, uh, a, 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 to get a particular uh, packing. So I mean, if I take spheres and I throw them in a container, I get the packing. I take them out and throw again, get a different packing. And if you try many, 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 many times, at some point you get the same packing. But later I'll show that indeed you have to tr try very many times. Now, uh, the thing is that. The, the entropy that said Sam Edwards defined is the log of the number of packings may or may not be the correct way to describe granular media. The only reason why I say may or may not be is that uh, when he postulated this statistical mechanics, there was a lot of debate about whether this was right or wrong. And to some extent, I could say the, the de debate fizzled out, or to phrase it more positively, the field moved on and, and left this behind because you couldn't compute the entropy. And the reason why the people couldn't compute the entropy is because it's not so easy to count the number of packings of, of, of particles in a container. And so what I'll try to explain now is how actually it is possible to get a good estimate of the, the number of packings of particles in a container. And to do that, I will talk not about uh, purely hard particles. It is actually convenient to take uh, particles that, are, that have a finite range of repulsion, like hard particles, but they're slightly soft. And the reason why I take slightly soft particles is because then I can define the potential energy of the system at any separation, not just, uh, I mean, that's not just zero or infinity, there are intermediate values in between. And then, you can imagine the following, that if I, if I take that system and I start the particles at, in, at a random initial position and I minimize the energy, I get an energy minimum. It's most likely some disordered state. Now I take another random initial position, I get a different energy minimum. And so this is what I've been trying to sketch here. Uh, what you should see here is the, the coordinates of not just in the end here, I have two coordinates, but if you have n particles in three dimensions, it's three n-dimensional space, but every red dot is a potential energy minimum. That means that if you have the system in that, at that stage, it is mechanically stable. Any small movement away from this minimum will bring the particle back. Actually, in every movement within this volume will bring the, part, the system back here, here it will, if you are here, the particle, the system is not a particle, it's a the system, all three end particles. You minimize the energy, you end up here, you minimize the energy here, you end up there. So this is how you can divide space into what you could call basins of attractions of the different energy minima. And the important thing is, of course, the energy minima, is, it's, a, it's a finite number, it may be huge, but it's finite, but importantly, uh, any point in this initial space, which is just the space of L all random initial configurations, you would say the, the phase space of an ideal gas, any point in this space, if you minimize the energy, you will end up in A minimum. And that means that these basins of attraction together completely tile the space. And that is very useful. Um, because now we're going to try to count the number of ways you can pack here. So, uh, I'll show you occasionally during my talk, home experiments. This is one of the home experiments I did. I tried it not too many times, but I here you see spheres packed in a container. This is one packing. I haven't tried to find out how long it would take until I get it back because, uh, well, for good reasons, as you'll find out in a minute. Now, when people tried initially to count the number of packings of spheres in a container, what they did is just to use the computer to generate the packing, the initial configuration, minimize, keep the packing in memory, make a new one, check, compare it with the old one, and on and on and on and on. But the thing is, you have to keep more and more structures in memory. And so you need a lot of memory, you need a lot of time. And typically this approach works for maybe uh, 15, 16 particles, and then maybe in the future for 17 or 18 particles, and then you run out of steam. And so this, this is just counting how, how long it takes until you revisit the same structure. The other route, route that we used is what I call the average volume route, and I'll explain in a minute what I mean by that. Now, uh, rather than, than actually uh, going into any technical detail, in particular about this system, I'll try to explain the approach by considering the following example. Um, suppose that you, you are uh, in a, you, you, you see a hotel, 
a big building, you can see it from the outside, and very often they look like a shoebox, so you may, may pretty much know how big the hotel is, at least the volume. And you want to know how many rooms there are, and so assume that you can't count from the outside. So how would you find out how many rooms there are in a hotel? And these two simulation techniques can be mapped onto two different, very strange strategies to count the number of rooms in a hotel. The first one is that you say, on the day that the hotel opens, I uh, apply for the job of receptionist. And for some strange reason, you're hired immediately, you can get to work. And you know how it works with remote hotels these days. You get, and then very often what you have to do is to, to program such a, ma a magnetic card with which people can open the door to their room. So first guest comes, you, you, uh, you give them a card, next person comes, you program the card, but actually you program it at random. And so uh, this is more or less what happens. You say, well, you don't say this, you think, take any room at random. So the second guest is a big hotel, happy, third guest. At some point, a guest comes back and says, there's somebody in my room. Okay. Then you know that you start to saturate the number of rooms in the hotel. So this is a strategy by which you can estimate, and certainly if you continue the, the procedure, actually at some point you'll be fired, but if you continue the procedure, uh, then this way is the way you can count the number of hotel, uh, the rooms in the hotel. Uh, but it doesn't work for very large uh, spaces, like if I now go back to the particle system, 15, 16 particles a year out of business. The other route, the average volume route that I will explain in a bit more detail is different. There, you're not a receptionist, you're a guest. And you come to the hotel and you say, give me any room. Now, and assume that it's an honest hotel and they don't say, oh, we have the royal suite or something. You just say, give me any room, you get a room, and then in the room, you take out a ruler, you're a cunning hotel guest, you take a ruler, you measure the size of the room. And then you go back to the reception and say, actually, I'd like another room, give me another random room. And so, after a while, you have measured the volume of a large number of rooms, assuming now, for the time being, that the corridors take up no volume, etc. So the hotel is completely filled with room. And they say, well, actually, I took a picture of the hotel, it's a shoebox, I know the volume, I know the average volume of the room, and therefore, I know how many rooms there are. But the point is that now you have translated a counting problem into a sampling problem, because you don't have to see, visit all the rooms to know what the average volume is. And so that is basically what you do here, and also with the, 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 this problem of counting the number of minima. You look at the average volume of the basin, you say, if I have the average volume of the basin times the number of volumes, then that is equal to the volume of this, this space. And so this is, this, is, this is known because for an ideal gas, this would be volume to the power n. This we don't know, but, but we sample and we get this as an answer. And so this is the, the way you can actually compute these volumes. Now, how do you do it technically? And this is, I, say, I don't say much about the technical things, but volumes in, high, in configuration space are the things we typically compute in simulations when you want to know a free energy. So actually, if you would write not the volume, but you would write minus kT times the log of the volume, then this would be typically a thing you compute in a free energy calculation. And this is more or less the way you, you standard do that. It may be expensive, but it's not exponentially expensive. It doesn't grow exponentially with system size. So this is the thing you, you can do to compute these, uh, these volumes. And I, I should admit one thing, and I have to quickly check my alarm to see if I'm allowed to say that. Yes, I'm allowed to say it. Uh, these volumes are very strange. Uh, I don't know uh, if, if, you, if you have seen people talk about energy landscapes. They, I mean, they're, they're limited by the dimensionality of paper and of our imagination. So the simplest one is that they, they draw a basin, like usually a parabola, maybe there's something else, another, another parabola next to it. Or if it's 2D, you see something, a basin that looks like an, an ellipse, and 3D, an ellipsoid, and then we run out of steam. And so we all assume that these higher dimensional basins are a bit like some hyper ellipsoid. Well, no, they are not. So to, to show that, I show here a cut through one of these basins. All points in this basin end up in the energy minimum. That may well be outside this plane, because this is a cut, and so it's not necessarily well, actually, sorry, the thing must be in the plane because this is along an eigenvalue vector of the Hessian. But anyway, so even this, the points in here, by some strange route, end up in the minimum. Not at all a straight route. So these, these volumes are highly non-convex and have, have, I mean, have extremely strange shapes. And uh, to explain how strange the shapes of these volumes are, I'll show you the following thing. And I'll, I'll, this is a picture I have to explain a bit. 
Um, suppose that you have a high dimensional space, and here we have actually 2,000 discs in two dimensions, so it's a 2,000 dimensional space. And we look at the volume of a basin, and we, we, know, we know that it's, if it would be a sphere, then everything up to the radius of the sphere would be filled, and after that, nothing. If we now take some other shape, we can divide it by the volume of the sphere with the same, same radius. So we, we just say, let's go up to radius r and see what fraction of the volume of the sphere is actually filled by the basin. And then you find that you can go out really far. This is the distance from the basin in some, well, I mean, some units that's important. The, the thing that is, I, I'm, I have to make sure that I don't lose my microphone. Uh, I, I, okay, good. The, the thing is that if you look at the, the, the fraction of the space of the sphere that is filled by the basins, you see that it goes down quite dramatically. Here it's e to the power of minus 4,000, here it's e to the power of minus 5,000. Incredibly tenuous. But the other thing you may know, at least those of you who live in higher dimension, is that in higher dimension, if you take a sphere in higher dimension, almost all of the volume lives very near the surface. And that is, in you, if once you don't have a sphere, that's no longer true. But still, almost all of the volume of this basin lives way out. So actually, in this case, the, the pink bit shows where all the volume is. So nothing here, nothing there, almost all there. But here, the density is incredibly low. It's about 10 to the power of minus 2,500. So you have a space where all the information is contained in a thing that if you would sample at random, you would never, ever find. So that, that is what I, I want to say. These are strange volumes, and so I, I represent them as a, as a high-dimensional sea urchin. But, I mean, a sea urchin doesn't do, uh, give credit to the real tenuousness of the space. Okay, but that's more mathematics than anything else. Right. The, the, the question that we now have to look at uh, in, in the context of the Edwards theory are actually two questions. Um, first, uh, Sam Edwards said the entropy um, is the, the, the log of the number of packings. But an entropy, if it, if it is, is worth the name entropy, has to have one important property, namely that it's extensive. If I double the system size, the entropy has to double. So this is one thing we have to test. The other thing that is implicit in the assumption S is K log W, or S is log W, because Boltzmann's constant really doesn't matter, S is log W, the other thing that is important in that, uh, in that assumption is that every state is equally likely. And uh, that is certainly true if you look at the, at the, the, the S is K log W of Boltzmann, so you basically say every energy state with the same energy has an equal probability to be occupied. And when Sam Edwards wrote S is log W, the, that was implicitly the same assumption. And so that's something else that you can test. And actually, from the simulations, we know that if you have an, an overpacked, so you take a system of these spheres and you compress it a bit so that they, they're mechanically stable, they don't, they're not almost falling apart, then we find that there's large volumes, small volumes, and if you prepare a state by randomly taking an initial point, then some volumes are more likely to be occupied than others. So the second assumption is under, under threat. But let's first look at this one. S is log omega, as a function of number of particles. Here we only went up to a, a 128, but as I showed you, we, we can go well beyond that now. The important thing is that you see that certainly entropy increases with system size, the other thing you can see is that actually log omega is pretty large. For 128 systems, it's 10 to the power of 250. This is why at home I didn't continue the experiment with the sphere in the vast, because it would have taken me a while to do this. Um, it is also the reason why the brute force method of just generating uh, configurations and then comparing with what you have already is, is, is also not competitive, because it is quite a bit slower. And so uh, you really need uh, a, a new tool there. And I mean, this is something I'd like to say in general about uh, computer algorithms. There is a, a, I mean, a steady, I would say, stream or a deluge of new computer algorithms where people think of ever smarter things to compute things, not necessarily better, but maybe, but, but certainly very often smarter. Um, on the whole, I prefer to do something like that only when I need it. And so in this case, we really, really needed it. Right. Um, now, as I already said, 
if different basins have different volumes, then it is not equally likely to generate all states because I've just used a protocol to generate the states by minimizing energy, then some states are more likely than others. And in, in that case, you should not use SSK log W. But even that problem had been solved because, before because Gibbs told us exactly what to do at that state, in that case. If you have a state that is formed with a probability uh, P, for a state I, PI, then the entropy of the system should be written as minus some PI log PI. In particular, the, the, the particular case, if all states are equally likely, then PI is just one over omega, and then mysteriously what you get is S is log omega. So you retrieve the Boltzmann limit, the S is log omega, if and only if uh, all states are equally likely to be occupied. So that is the, uh, the, the, the thing you can do, and then you can actually look at that entropy, and that on the whole it is not very different. And the, the, for us the advantage is that to compute log omega is not so easy. And the reason why it's not so easy is precisely because we're not sampling volumes without bias. We sample the large volumes with a higher probability than the small volumes. And so if you then want to get the entropy, you have to correct for the bias, and this you can only do if you know the functional form of the probability distribution, which we do, or I mean, at least we have from the simulation a hint what it is, and so we can do that. But this is much easier because we, here we don't have to extrapolate anything or to, to, in, to interpret the data in any other way. We just compute this directly, and so this is really nice. And then, uh, as I said, when all states are equally likely, you get this, is that. Uh, now, if you look, and now I use this definition, as is, is minus some p log p, you get something that's very, very similar, it's almost quantitatively the same, but there is a problem. And the problem is, as I said, entropy has to be extensive. Well, you may not worry too much about it, but extensivity really means that this line should go through the origin, and it doesn't. And so this is something that, uh, that we did, di discussed at the group meeting, and I, I'm sure that you have group meetings too, so this is a kind of free-for-all, where in a very democratic way uh, you discuss things, and so I, I have here a picture of one of our group meetings, so you see it's very democratic, and so um, I, I look at the picture and then I say, well, it's not very linear, is it? And so these are the, the, the student, Daniel uh, Asenjo and the postdoc, Fabien Parisson, who were working on the project uh, at the time, and I said, it's not very linear. Uh, so maybe what we should do is to subtract log n factorial. Rather, it's like dividing omega, the number of states, by n factorial, which in, in statistical mechanics you very often do if you talk about, let's say, argon or something, you say, wait a minute, I mean, dividing my log uh, n factorial. This is strange, because how do you make these packings in the simulation? You don't take spheres that are all the same size, because then they would form crystals. You take spheres that have all different sizes. And, and indeed, then Daniel and... Uh, and as Fabian said, but listen, these are polydispersed particles, so they have a size distribution, and so they're distinguishable. And so you can't just divide by n factorial. Okay, I'm all in favor of democracy up to a point, and I say, okay, try anyway, good. So, right. Um, if you do that, oh, actually, I tried to explain it here, but okay, that's something else. If you do that, then you find, now, now here the, we also have the 3D results that are actually later and therefore better statistics. You find now that this entropy divided by with all the, the, with the n factorial correction actually is extensive. It goes nicely through the origin. Nicely through the origin is in this case in this, the statement that the data are compatible with a straight line that goes through the origin. I mean, still, they're expensive calculations, so the, the statistics is a bit limited. But, uh, it, it, it strongly suggests that this log n factorial, uh, so the, the dividing the number of states by n factorial for distinguishable particles gives you the correct entropy. Um, and by the way, uh, before I continue, because I'll say a bit more about this n factorial, I just want to say that maybe you don't care at all about granular entropy. I mean, you would be totally justified to say, I don't want to know about it. But this way of counting the number of states of a system when the number is incredibly large by sampling the volumes may have other applications. So there's, there's, uh, I mean, there's, there's some applications in deep neural nets where you, 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 you have, well, you train the net, you have many different possible outputs 
of the, given the inputs, but you don't know how many. And so how do you count? This is possibly your way of doing it. It hasn't been done yet, but the other thing is materials discovery. I say just a few words about it. Uh, there are techniques, I mean, as you know, there's a lot of high throughput numerical screening of new mater materials. And one of the techniques that people use is to just take a number of atoms, usually not too many, 10, 20, 30, minimize the energy, and uh, so and, and that, that, now it's not argon or something, it is really like selenium, gold, uh, germanium, I don't know, anything where you think you can form an interesting compound. You minimize the energy and you find what structure you get. Uh, and then you try again, you find maybe the same structure or some other structure. And this way you can find structures that uh, have either been, not been seen before or have been seen before. For instance, this is the way a new high pressure structure of, of hydrogen was uh, was pro predicted by uh, uh, by uh, Chris Picard in Cambridge. And so it is actually a technique to predict new materials, but occasionally something strange happens. Uh, you know the experimental structure, you know it's stable because you can put, the, in, in your, in, at least in your models, you can do the model calculation, you find that that structure is mechanical stable. You try to generate it, you try, you try, you try, and you never find it. And so when Chris Picard told me about this, or he gave a lecture and said, so we tried, I don't know, a few thousand times, and then we gave up. And he said, maybe we should have tried one more time, maybe we th should have tried a million more times, who knows? And then after th the talk, I said, well, I think in principle, at least I know how you can tell, because if you know the basin of attraction of that minimum, you can compute how likely it is that you would find it. So that's what I mean about materials discovery. Okay. But I'll come back to the, the end factorial, because that is the mystery that remains. <coughs> so, uh, I mean, it seems that when I said, oh, let's just divide the number of packings of a system, of poorly dispersed system, by end factorial, uh, that that was totally arbitrary, but it's not. And I will not discuss this in the terms, in the context of a granular material, but in the context of something much more common, namely a colloidal suspension. Um, if you think of colloidal suspensions, then you very often try to make these suspensions, the, the, the particle in the suspension, to have, for instance, all the same size. Now, all the same size means usually to within a few percent the same size, and even if they would be all identically the same size, they would not have the same structure, because typically these materials are plastics, or PMMA, or the silica glass, and so the local structure of these particles is different. No two colloids are the same. And so, still people use statistical mechanics to describe colloids, and when they write a partition function, divide, they divide by n factorial. They usually don't say anything about it, but there is an issue, because these particles are distinguishable. So, what happens uh, in this case? What we have to address is what's called the Gibbs paradox, and Gibbs is, is one of my other heroes. Um, the, uh, there, there is in, in, uh, a Russian colleague of mine uh, says that in the former Soviet Union, there was a, a, a quote about uh, Gibbs, and there was the following that says that in the history of the Western civilization, I know that Gandhi said, oh, that would be a good idea, but that's something else. In, in, the, in the history of Western civilization, um, there are only book, two books that are considered to be infallible, namely the Bible and the completed works of J. Willard Gibbs, but on the whole, the evidence is stronger for the completed work of J. Willard Gibbs. Now I realize this will be on YouTube, so I may get hate mail now, but okay, good. <laughs> right. Um, the, the thing is that Gibbs was not infallible because he won, made one serious mistake, and the serious mistake is that when he introduced the concept of a chemical potential, he called it the chemical potential. And believe it or not, but it's at least my experience, that in physics, people really think, well, this is chemistry, I don't have to know it. No, you do have to know it, because it's really important. So just think of it of the Fermi energy and it's all fine. But I mean, don't ignore the chemical potential. I'll be not talking about the chemical potential, but the Gibbs paradox. Do you know this thing where you have two different gases in, in the volume 2V, you divide, you remove the dividing surface, the entropy goes up. Now you have two identical gases, you remove this, the dividing surface, and Gibbs says, and nothing happens. And then people were, and, uh, were wondering about this. And in all the statistical thermodynamic textbooks, certainly the ones that I read when I was a student, it was very clear. It says that this all has to do with the quantum mechanical indistinguishability of particles. So, I mean, I, these are different quotes. I don't mention what the books are. I mean, even, I mean but, but even we in our book on simulation wrote something like this. That, and that we didn't say this explicitly, but... Uh, only a correct quantum mechanical treatment gives rise to consistent entropy. 
Gibbs or got a logic, firm logical basis after the invention of quantum theory. Uh, and this is a book from the 20th century, so the Gibbs paradox foreshadowed in the, the last century. Actually, it's not even true, because Gibbs wrote this explicitly only in the 20th century, but okay, uh, conce the conceptual di difference were only resolved satisfactory by the advent of quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics. So basically they say it's the indistinguishability of particles. Now, not everybody says this. And so, I mean, in, in the recent years, one, one person who has written really nice papers about it is Robert Swenson, but I'll refer to some earlier papers. Uh, one that I like in particular is, is Nico van Kampen, who is a great critic of everybody, that everybody else, anything that everybody else says. And so in this particular case, he says about the n factorial, my point that this is irrelevant, the quantum thing. Even in classical statistical mechanics, it can be derived by logic rather than by the somewhat mystical arguments of Gibbs and Planck. So there I go, Gibbs and Planck, uh, because they use mystical arguments. Um, the person who actually is most explicit is uh, James. James has written an article about the Gibbs paradox, a really nice paper, uh, where he, he, he says, the following, usually Gibbs prose style conveys his meaning in a sufficiently clear way. Now, as you, as you are all scientists or in the business process of becoming scientists, you would like to know what a, uh, your clock is, is different from mine. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, fine. Anyway, uh, in a sufficiently clear way. So, so basically you, say, you would like to know how clear do I have to be to be sufficiently clear? And the answer is very simple. It says, using no more than twice as many words as Poincaré or Einstein would have used to say the same thing. <laughs> if you're there, you're in business. Okay, good. Uh, now Gibbs. But occasionally Gibbs, he delivers a sentence with a ponderous intelligibility that seems to challenge us to make sense out of it. And this is precisely the sentence about the Gibbs paradox. Because what Gibbs writes is the following, and I, I'll read it for you because then it's easier to understand. It says, again, when such gases have been mixed, there is no more impossibility of the separation of the two kinds of molecules in virtue of their ordinary motion in the gas's mass without any special external influence than there is of the separation of homogeneous gas into the same two parts into which it has once been divided after these two have once been mixed, right? Okay, so you can imagine there's some confusion about the Gibbs paradox. And so, uh, as I said, occasionally you have to do experiments. So in this case, I thought, let's do the experiment. So I, I do colloidal suspension. And uh, I, I try to see if there's an entropy change if I uh, separate them and then I remove the, sep the, the separation again. So here is the separation. It, and I, all right, so here I take it out and I check whether the entropy has changed. I look and I come to the conclusion that actually nothing has changed, so the entropy is the same. <laughs> and in my second part of the experiment, I do the reverse. I just follow Gibbs to the letter. So there I go. I try, it requires great care as you can see, but okay. And I'm extremely happy because the entropy hasn't changed. Good, so um, now try to understand this. And now I, I overestimate the difference between these particles. This is two colloidal suspensions and they're in two different volumes. And let's assume that these particles have the, all the same size, but they're different and that's why I gave them different sizes. And we, can, and we just make it extremely dilute. Why? Because if it's extremely dilute, and we even take away the solvent, they're an ideal gas of polydispersed dispersed particles, and we can compute the partition function quantum mechanically. Nothing classical about it. We know it. And apart from factors that actually are unimportant, it is just v to the power n. And so you say, okay, but that, if that, that is actually, if I take the log of that, I would have the entropy, but that is not extensive. So in this case, the entropy is not extensive, then I say, okay, now I take uh, two systems where I can, the total number of particles is fixed, but I can exchange them. And I get this thing, V1 to the power N1, V2 to the power N2, and then this is the way in which you can permute the particles without changing the observable states, like in my milk. If particles, two fat globules are exchanged, I don't see any difference. That's important, because if I now, again, this is not extensive, but if I now look at the most likely state, I have to say, what is the, 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 the log omega, the, the n? And I, if I change n1, I also change n2, because this is fixed. And what comes out is this. 
This is the condition for equilibrium. And suddenly, magically, the n factorial appears. But it has nothing to do with the indistinguishability of particles. It has to do with the indistinguishability of macrostates. And, and that, that is the, the key thing also for the granular entropy. Now, this led to some unfortunate consequences. I don't know whether you read the Wiener Zeitung in your free time. But you see here, the, the, face, the derange scientists defaced the Boltzmann grave. And there, you see the, actually a picture of the moment that it happened. Um, Here's the SSK log W, and this person divided it by n factorial, uh, qualified it though a bit, they say, for particles that not are indistinguishable, but are indis if you don't distinguish them. And that is actually uh, what the key thing is. If you don't, if there's no measurable change in the macro state, then this is what you should do to get consistent thermodynamics. And with that, uh, I'm almost done. I just want to say for the adverse hypothesis, I say, he assumed all packings were equally likely. For overpacked systems, it's not true. And then we found that actually, um, if you if you go close to uh, the point where it becomes unjammed, so where it starts to be mobile, you find that actually, in that case, the entropy, according to Gibbs, that's the green thing, or to Boltzmann, seem to coincide exactly at the point where you have unjamming. And that, as the two things are equal if and only if all states are equally likely. So actually, it seems that that's precisely where all states are equally likely. And so apparently, magically, uh, well, he was a genius, but Samet was right. Uh, one last picture, entropy of society. Can you talk about entropy to other people? Well, in the current climate, I would say no. And, and this is where I'd like to stop with a quote from our current Minister, Secretary of State of the Environment and Rural Affairs. People in this country have had quite enough of experts. Thank you very much. Yeah, I guess uh, <clears throat> we have time for a few questions. So. Alexa, yes, question. Yeah, uh, I have a question about uh, this issue of probabilities of different states. So the way you basically defined, you looked at the volume of individual basin and then said that within that volume you sample more or less proportional to the volume, but uh, the uh, thermodynamic entropy, right, it's based on uh, the notion that there is dynamics there, the, uh, the, uh, some classical mechanic that sort of preserves the volume in, in, in the phase space. We don't really have this uh, for uh, granules. This, this is a very important question. Um, the, the thing is, why do I uh, assume that that I just can say the probability to occupy the state is proportional to the, the volume and phase space that corresponds to the base of attraction? The answer is that for granular materials, everything depends on the protocol that you use to prepare them. And so if you were to prepare a granular material by starting from an ideal gas, which you can't and you won't, but if, you, if that was what you would do, then this would be the correct way. In practice, there are very many different ways in which to prepare granular materials, and in principle, they should all have different entropies. And so uh, this is one of the big open questions, how much these entropies differ, and if, they, I mean, and if in principle, other protocols should... I think we should be able to compute similarly the, the basin of attraction, although in these cases, is, these basins are not compact. So the nice thing here is the basin is compact. In the other case situation, and now I just say a few technical terms, but you can ignore it. A basin doesn't have a volume, it has a probability mass. So you, you start at a given point, and there's a certain probability that you end up with. In principle, and we actually have the tools to do it, in principle you can compute it. I think it's going to be, at the moment, still horrendously expensive, but very interesting. Uh, hi. Uh, in something like the Gibbs entropy uh, in a classical uh, colloidal system, uh, then the pi, uh, how, uh, what would be the analog of the n factorial uh, there? Is it an effective n factorial for the particular? Okay, so the, the, the thing is that in a, in a colloidal system, if you have sufficiently monodispersed colloids, and that means sufficiently in the sense that uh, in the experiments, you don't distinguish between smaller and larger colloids, then it would be just n factorial. If it would be 
the uh, a system where you have a very wide distribution, you can easily separate the larger from the smaller particles, then you get basically a way by which you're going to bin the distribution, and then you still get one of n factorial, but then multiply by some x log x uh, kind of expression. Uh, the, the one thing you can never get rid of is that for a polydispersed system, the absolute well, the, the, the value of the entropy, so actually the slope that relates entropy to the particle size, the system size, depends on the binning. And so in this case, there was only one bin, so I more or less didn't discuss it, but in general, it depends on the binning, and if you take the bin infinitely narrow, the whole thing actually diverges. But still, if you compare two systems with the same binning, it's totally well-defined. <laughs> Okay, are there uh, other questions? I don't see any. So how do I can compute entropy for hard sphere packings? I mean, where I don't have the potential energy, either okay. it's zero or infinite? Actually, that's so the, to compute the entropy for hard sphere packings, and now talk about the Boltzmann entropy, if that's okay, uh, then what you actually do is the... Uh, technically, it's the same as what we did in the case of, the, of these granular materials. You... Uh, well, it depends on whether it's ordered or disordered. For the ordered case, you can actually uh, s basically look at, compare at the difference between the entropy of the, the hard sphere packing and, say, a system that you know. And now we often use the Einstein crystal, and we slowly transform the hard sphere crystal into an Einstein crystal. And then we can actually use thermodynamic integrations to get the difference. For the disordered packings, uh, the, you do it differently. You basically would compare the entropy with the, uh, the entropy of a, of a fluid, and so you would look at what happens if you slowly compress the fluid. Although, in principle, the techniques I was using here with the basins should also allow you to compute the entropy. But it hasn't been done. So, the range of that random closed packing where you showed the, the peak in the maximum entropy, so is there a one-to-one uh, -one correlation based on the protocol that you use and the initial configurations that you choose to end up at that maximum peak? Um, so, I mean, I, I, so I, I have to be a bit careful because when I showed the peak, the, the peak in, the, in this, the, in the, uh, ma the maximum peak, that was the, the uh, actually something to do with where the volume of basin of attraction was, was located. Uh, that, in principle, would also depend on the protocol, but as I said, for protocols other than the one we used, the calculations would be much more expensive, and so we, we don't really have any, any numbers on that yet. But it would be a really interesting question. Okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, if uh, there are no more questions, let's uh, thank uh, Don for a wonderful lecture. <laughs>